Tell Me What to Read is recorded on the lands of the Wongal people, and we pay our respects to all elders past and present, and extend our welcome to any First Nations people listening today. This is Tell Me What to Read, brought to you by Booktopia. I'm your host, Nick Wasiliev, and welcome to the show where we chat about the next great books you should be reading with the authors behind them and familiar faces who read them. All books mentioned in today's show can be found right now at booktopia.com.au, and the links can be found in the description. Hello, my name's Justin Hamilton. I am talking with Will Anderson about his new book, I Am Not Fine, Thanks. And I knew you weren't fine the moment I saw the title because it is not a pun. And uh, (laughs) was was this a conscious decision to uh, move away from the pun titles uh, to show that this is something a little more serious in the the genre of books? They said, um, we want a book title. And we yeah. and we don't want to be we don't want it to be a pun. Um, if if you're okay with that, and I said I am not fine, thanks. And they said we're like great title, and I was like no, hang on, I meant <laughs> with the fact that it wasn't a pun. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> no, the interesting thing about it was, um, as you well know, normally when I write something, in fact, so I've just to give people the context of this, uh, so I've just signed off on the artwork, poster, mm. and name. For my 2023 tour, will illuminate an incredible new piece of art by James Fosdyke, who did the cover, of course, of "I Am Not Fine Things," and mm. uh, does all the, my podcast art. And as you know, Justin, um, but you have to sign off on that well before you've started to imagine what the show is, right? And so, part of the reason that my show titles have always had will puns. Is partly like, you know, because of a fun bit of, you know, branding and puns and it became a bit of a thing that, you know, people identify with me. But mostly it's just through the fact that I get asked what the title of my show is going to be well before I start thinking about what my show is going to be. And I didn't want to be one of those comedians who fell into the trap of calling my show something like, you know, 10 amazing things I learned from my dad and then you get to February and you're on stage at the Adelaide Fringe and you realise your dad only taught you seven amazing things and you've really got to <laughs> pat out the last 20 minutes by going, airplane food's pretty bad, isn't it, guys? <laughs> Men and women are different. They are so different. Like cats and dogs, though. Has anyone ever brought up that cats and dogs are different like men and women are? So uh, so basically the, the will pun thing has really just been, become a very convenient way of me being able – and sometimes they match – Obviously, when I did my show about being arrested, Will Legal was a pretty good name for that show. And, and you know, Will Logical felt like a pretty good name for, you know, the show that I wrote in 2022, which was about the last couple of years. But often the name, like, the name really has nothing to do with the show when I sit down to write the show. And then sometimes after you see the show, you can then go, oh, yeah, that's why it's called that name. But the truth is that those two two things are often completely separate from each other. Right. I don't sit down with the name of the show and that that the name of the show is never my starting point for writing the show. It barely ever informs what the show is. It just is the name of the show and it sometimes matches yeah. like what the show content is. But if it does, it is often – pretty much incidental like you know it's it, it's coincidental you know like it, it it was not on purpose in any way so it was very different with the book in that i handed them a manuscript and and the question was asked do you want to call it like a wheel pun that was like one of the the questions and i said no i don't think that i do like yes. i think that the book should be the wheel puns are for the stand-up shows you know, yes. I've written two previous books. Um, neither of them had will puns, Survival of the Dumbest and Friendly Fire. And I didn't think that this one should have a will pun, even though there is about – the book's about 70,000 words and about 7,000 of them are very similar to the words that appear in Will Logical um, yeah. because the book is kind of about, you know, like it's comedy going away. Like part of the book is about comedy going away and then – that path, that long winding road back to getting back on stage to do Will Logical. So it tells the story of 
how Willogical came to be, but the story of Willogical is also contained within the book, you know? Um, yeah. And, and it, so, sorry, I was just going to say that. So I handed them the manuscript and I said, I don't know, you tell me what you think it's called. And they came back pretty quickly, almost too quickly, and said, we'd <laughs> like to call it I Am Not Fine, thanks. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Am I not fine? <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling pretty good until I got this email. I was feeling I was great. I just font. handed in my fucking manuscript. I was wrapped. I really felt like I had a weight off my shoulders that had been on yeah. my shoulders for the last two years. Well, maybe the person who read it was writing yeah. back. Yeah, I'm not fine, thanks. Is this a cry for help? Thanks, yeah. Are you okay after reading this? Um, but the funny thing is that then I had to go back and, and reread the book several times for editing purposes, but also for the audio book. And I realized that even though I hadn't intended that to be the title, it is absolutely the theme of the book. You know, it is a book about, you know, every single chapter is imbued with this sense of why I am not fine, whether it might be about, you know, my world, my career, my personal circumstances, you know, whether it's billionaires going to space who could be fixing everything. Everything is kind of about me looking at the world and realising that when somebody says, how are you, that the most honest answer is to say, I am not fine, thanks. So it's a it's a tough title to live with because it means that every single mm-hmm. interview I've done press-wise has started with somebody asking me how I am and thinking they're the first person who's come up with that clever question. Oh mate, you, the worst thing is is that they've probably workshopped yeah. it. I know. Got a big laugh in the in got a big laugh in the TV yeah. production room and they said this will be the first question. I'll ask him how how yeah. he is. Uh but but it's I think it's a good title. Like I'm I'm really happy with the title. I think it really sums up what the what the book is about. Uh, the image on the cover as well. You shouldn't have a judge a book by its cover, but maybe you should. In this case, this I would highly recommend so you judge the book by its cover. <laughs> and, you, and your judgment would be, this looks like an awesome book. Yeah. But can I tell you a quick little story about the cover? So James Foz, James Foz like, who does all the original artwork for my um, podcast, you can find all his artwork at tofop.com, all these illustrations. Uh, that's what we're going to call the book when he eventually put it out. That one will have a will pun. Um but yeah. he's done all my tour posters. He does all my art. But this was a speci- you know, a really, you know, great project. Like, and he put a lot of his, you know, time and effort into this. And we did an entire faux fop episode, which is one of my podcasts people can find and have a listen to James and I talking about all the work he put into it. But my favourite thing about it is that uh, uh, the image on the front cover has little references to various themes that are in the book. So the more you look at the front cover, the more you can see all the various things that are popping out of my, you know, opened head are thing, things that are yeah. in the book. You know, this is the level of detail that James brings to these sort of things. They're not random images. They're all there in the book. But there is a snake that wraps around my head on the front cover. Yeah. And at the very last moment, I was talking to uh, Malcolm Knox, who was editing the book, who's a brilliant editor and a great writer in his own right. And uh, we got to the last bit and he said, look, you know, it's almost done, but he said there's about 2% of the book that um, he said just, you know, he said, I think it would just benefit from losing 2%. And uh, I said, you yeah, know, what 2%? And he was like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> and right. uh, so the 2% that I lost was this uh, the story that was about the snake, uh, which it turns right. out was not the bit Malcolm was suggesting. He quite liked that story and was a bit disappointed that I'd taken it out. But he was, he was right. I, I think that the book is better without I, – I reread through it and I was like, you know, this story is really consistent and I feel like this is the one story that doesn't really thematically fit into the rest of it, even though it's a funny story. Um, and I, I said to James, I said, look, um, I have taken out uh, the story about the snake. And he said, well, I'm not taking it out of the front cover. He said, he said <laughs> it's an analogy or a metaphor or something now, but I'm fucking leaving it in yeah. the art. I am not taking it out. Yeah, that's yeah. the part that's interactive for the reader. Yeah. They can uh, decide what the snake uh, represents when they uh, get to the that's end right. of That's right. It's a choose your own adventure, uh, the snake. You can, you can tell me what you think the snake represents. You know, with uh, writing uh, stand-up and then writing a book, uh, one of the things that when you work on something at home, then you get to say it out loud and that's where you get the rhythm. Mm. Uh, 
how did you, uh, when you were rewriting this, did you read it out loud to get the rhythm of your own voice or how did your approach differ? So it's weird actually. So uh, most of the material in this book was conceived as stand-up. Some of it I've actually done as stand-up. Um, a lot of it was stuff that I only got to do a couple of times as stand-up because then the pandemic happened. Um, so the book is, all, is about all that but it is also the product of that. You know, in the way that yeah. you and I like to do things, um, you know, multi-layered and like I like projects to have more than one layer and I like to work on – so the book is – yeah, the book is a book in its own right but it is also a book about stand-up going away and it's a book that is the stand-up that went away because – you know, so the book is about the thing but it is also the thing. Yeah. Um, so almost everything in the book was conceived as – as uh, as stand up, um, there's one story at the start, the very first story, which is about a gig that I was doing in Adelaide, basically when the last gig I did before everything changed forever, and uh, um, that's the one bit that I'd never really even conceived as being stand up. Right, like the, the, and that again wasn't that was the bit, uh, Malcolm, who was such a great editor, he was the person who. Um, thought that that should be the first bit of the book that it was it was re- in fact i went ra- back and it was originally probably only about a thousand words and i think it's nearly three thousand words that opening story now because i went back because it was going to be the first story in the book i went back and substantially sort of rewrote it and reimagined it and so it's the only thing in there that really wasn't conceived as stand-up but as a story about a stand-up gig and I'd rewritten it and reimagined it so many times that I'd almost forgotten that it was like based on a true story. And then right. a great friend, a mutual friend of ours, the person who may have I've, – in the book I've kept it everything – I've tried not to specifically identify people or places very much in the book and uh, because that's not the point of the book. Yeah. And <clears throat> But the story that that story is about – did happen in a specific place and, you know, with specific people on a specific day. And the person who books that uh, gig has currently been reading the book. Right. <laughs> and sent me a message and had photos of the incident I talked. So the opening story is about, uh, you know, like the, so there was a guy who – the middle of this gig, uh, there's a, there's a, a, I won't tell the whole story, but there is a, 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 like the way that the gig was set up was there was a blank space down the middle of the, you know, an aisle where people would come in and there was a door down the front and a door down the back. And firstly, I was talking about, you know, I explained why as a comedian having an aisle down the middle is the worst because the place that you're trying to perform to has no people, but also yeah. that in this room that like, you know, once the gig started, come in the back. Right? Yes. Because if you come in the front, you go past the stage. So I tell this yep. story about this guy who comes in the front and and wackiness in shoes and I end up like patting him on his head, right? Like something that you would never do in like, you know, post-COVID time. So it's the time of the last time that you could do something like that. But I've like kind of rewritten that story so many times that I've almost forgotten that it was a real story. Right. And then the, this person that I'm talking about, our mutual friend who runs that gig, sent me two messages. One was... Uh, hey man, I'm going to think about rearranging the setup in that room for next time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is like a long passive aggressive uh, right. suggestion on I how had, you could run your room better. I hadn't really imagined <laughs> that scenario when I was writing it. Yeah. Um, but I also didn't know that there was documentary evidence of the actual incident, right? right. And you don't know how much of it you've exaggerated, and, but of course, this person had literally had photos of that moment of me with my hand on top of this guy's head that he like sent me through. He goes, I never shared these with you, but thought you might find it funny that like, and he had like literally, I could, I'm like, oh my God, I thought that I'd kind of exaggerate not, you know, not, I mean, not exaggerated in a way of like not telling it like it was true, but I no, thought. I just added some jazz to it. Yeah. But it yeah. turns out I just kind of said what happened. It happened, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said he was three rows from the back. He's like, maybe he was four in the photo, but right. I really hadn't exaggerated it at all. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so funny. <laughs> It's uh, it's such a funny thing to think about uh, the idea of comedy being over or 
changing or or mm. being so tricky. Uh, I'm curious to know what you think it is. My theory is that as a society, we have given up the responsibility of context and uh, context for words, context for meaning, and you know, instead, it's all just become reactionary, which therefore makes things like satire and uh, the making of jokes uh, a, a tricky path to walk so, down. Sometimes. I mean, it's very interesting. Like when you write a book. Because yeah. you don't you don't have context, yeah, at all. Like I mean, you know, many of these jokes that I did on stage, like I have the context of being in the room with those people and like knowing how they're reacting to them and being able to manage that. But you don't have that at all when you write a book. And I found it. Oh, so you asked me about the idea of like, did I say it out loud? Um, mm. I wrote it a lot of it to do a stand-up. So I write it in my on-stage voice. You know, I will repeat words, I'll repeat things. Like there's a way that you write to – I don't write things out in long form. I write them as if that I would say them on stage, you know, get yeah. to the point as quickly as you possibly can. Often there's repetition and rhythm and like very much because you're – and then one of the things that like Malcolm had to do was like knock some of those – edges off he goes like the brain works in a different way when people are reading things yeah. to when they're hearing you say them so sometimes you don't need to repeat that or you need to say yeah. that in a different way and so he had to help me reimagine some of that without losing that sense of this is in my voice but then i had to do the audio book where right. i had to read it all out and that was incredibly difficult a because yeah. i've never listened to an audio book it's just not the way that i like to like I like to feel the book in my hand. I don't even read on like a Kindle or any of those sort of things. Yeah. So I, I just like the the book and I don't mind if people tear the pages or make notes in the margins or like I think that's like I, I like that. That's what I've always loved about books. Like you know, Sorry, as a Virgo, I'm just going to vomit for a second. Yeah. And then I'll come back with <laughs> yeah, you. I know you'd hate that. But <laughs> I like that. If I yeah. see somebody and, you know, it's it's tattered, it's red, it's stained with their coffee mug that they had on the other page, then that's – that's actually what I like about books, you know. So, um, but it was really interesting. So I had to, like, it took three days to record the audio book to read the whole thing. It's about six hours in total. And uh, um, some of it w felt really weird. And the bits that were the weirdest to read were the bits that I have done as stand up, but then yeah. we changed slightly in the way that they're set and structured so that they would be better to be read by people. But then I had to then say them out loud so it was like this is my joke but it still feels weird in my mouth because the way that it's written down is actually still different to the way that I would have said it if I was performing it on stage so now I'm this joke existed on stage yeah it existed in a slightly different way in print and now it's being said out loud as if it would be a thing that I was saying on stage but it's not the way that I would say it on stage so that was a I found that an incredibly like yeah. interesting and challenging experience. You're physically trying to do something that goes against the memory of repetition. It's and that's hard. Yeah. And also I think it must be like you know when you hear about an athlete who has to learn how to run in a new way, like you mm. know to yeah. protect their hamstrings or something. They're getting a lot yeah. of one particular injury so they have to actually reimagine their whole style of running and you're like, "Well, I've never really thought about how I run." Yeah. Like my running style has just developed, my comedic style, my stage style, the way that I speak on stage has been almost developed naturally and instinctively over the years, whereas now it's very deliberate and you have to then deliver it in that deliberate way, which is, yeah, it was very interesting. You you know uh, the author Brian K Vaughan has mm. been quoted as saying that uh, he hates writing, but he likes having written. And uh, you know, you, as a stand-up comedian in Australia, you have to keep coming up with new shows every year. And uh, I, do you relate to that, or do you enjoy the actual process? Oh no, I don't enjoy the process of all or at all. And this, the process of this book, I did not enjoy in any way. Like it was birthed in an incredibly difficult time in my life, and it's funny because I've had a few people read the book and you know sort of reach out and. Yeah, you go, oh, man, this is like heavy. The funny thing is that most of the really heavy things, this this is a very palatable version. Like, you know, often 
often, you know, the real heavy things that were happening in my life, there is some of that emotion or insight fed into the stories that are in the book. But the stories that are in the book are in no way, they're the most palatable and most shareable, you know, the, the parts of me that I'm willing to, you know, share with the world. Um, but they are, so it's certainly not a documentary of the last couple of years of my life. You know, there are, it was written in a really hard time and, uh, I don't like writing at the best of times. I absolutely agree with that idea that it's nice to have written. Mm. Um, I don't find writing hard. I just don't enjoy it. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like, like I, I, you know, that I, sometimes I hear people go, oh, you know, I sit down and I won't leave my desk until I've written a thousand words. I can, I can write 3,000 words in a day. That's not Mm -hmm. the issue. I just don't like doing it. And I like having done it. Yeah. And I like editing. I will say. Oh, yeah. I love editing. Editing's fun. I would, and I wish that if I, you know, and again, like, I mean, everyone's happy with the book and I am the only person who thinks this, but you know, this is me and I'm allowed to think this. I, I would have loved another edit. Now that it's out, I would have loved to go, ah, oh, just one more. I just would have loved one more edit. Now that I really know what it is that I was trying to achieve, but that's just me. Like everybody yeah. else seems to be very happy with it. But and um, you know what would have happened if you got that edit, hmm. you would have wanted one more edit. <laughs> well, that's it. And that's yeah. part of the thing about why, working on stage is so great yeah. is because eventually you just have to do it. Yeah. Like you, you book the theater. Like, yeah. because if, you if, I, if, if I waited until I thought the show was ready, I'd never, will never, have, have, done I'd a never have done a show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the, uh, I think that's the thing that's yeah. the most appealing about festivals is that yeah. they're there and you book them six months out and then, you have to do it. And to be honest, I find that uh, the, the moment when you, like in the lead up, you can get out of it at any point. Yeah. And so the day that it's about to happen, I find the most relaxing because it's like, oh, well, nothing I can do. I've done as much as I can. Yeah. And uh, let's just get to it. So I love editing. Yeah, I love the editing. Once it's written and then I can start to move it all about and play with it and start to shape the story. And that's very much how I write. Like I... I don't write with any deliberate plan at all, both in stand-up and in, um, you know, with this book because they were both written in very similar ways, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Like um, is, you know, there's that old Michelangelo quote about the, the you know, the statues already inside the piece of rock. You just got to know which bits to get rid of. And yeah. um, the, the, the difference is with stand-up, you firstly have to construct the piece of rock. And yeah. that's mostly what I do. I just empty out my head and I just don't know what, what if it's good and what if it's bad. I just am like, here's everything that's in here. I'll just get all that down on the page and then I just start to chip away the things that don't interest me and then often what you're left with ends up being either the show or in this case the book. And um, then I you know, start to edit and join it all together and make it make sense, you know, in, and um, yeah. So that was very much my process. I, I – like the, looking back on it, I think this book, the one thing I will say is it really did, there was plenty of times while I was doing it that I was like, what am I doing? Like, you know, if, if I, I don't want to be doing this, this is too hard. But now that it's done, I really would like to do it again. Right. Now that I've done it, I'm like, oh, I know how I could do it better next time. And the fact that people have liked it this time, you know, is really encouraging because I'm like, I could, this is, I can do better than this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Get that next edit going. The, uh, what did it, did the idea of it change over time? Like, did you, is the book what you thought it was going to be or did it uh, metamorphosize in ways that you weren't expecting? I thought it was very much going to be only about the last couple of years. And originally it was very chronological. It started with comedy going away, April 2020, which would have been 25 years in a row at the Comedy Festival, felt like a really good place to start. Both, you know, with the material, but also the fact that, like, that's a good story. That's like, and, you know, I knew that, you know, moving near Mullumbimby, the anti-vax capital of Australia at the start of a global pandemic would give me... I wanted to talk about the pandemic 
and that gave me a good personal perspective where I could just tell a personal story that would have a broader context of being able to talk about, you know, science and not just my personal COVID experience, but like something that was more reflective of issues that everybody was dealing with and grappling with during that time. So I knew that those two things were going to be part of the story. And I knew that I wanted to talk about the things that were frustrating me in the world, you know, that idea of like, you know, so much of it was about like, if this was the last opportunity I had to say something, which is a thought that we've had a lot, you know, as artists during this time, what is it that I would want to say? And I knew I wanted to talk about things like climate change and my frustration with the fact that, you know, that we do have these people who have this inordinate amount of wealth who could actually do something about making the world a better place and uh, instead not, not doing that and that I wanted to be able to encapsulate that in some way. And I knew as we got towards the end of it, that maybe the story was going to be about me getting to go back to do a stand-up again, that maybe that's mm-hmm. how it would finish. But in the end, that isn't really how it does finish. The, funnily enough, the Lismore floods, so the you know Northern Rivers floods happened, which meant that I didn't get to the Melbourne Comedy Festival for an extra week, um, you know, delayed that, that thing that I'd been sort of working towards, you know, for an extra week. I wasn't able to be there. And... Weirdly enough, obviously, climate change had been such a huge theme throughout the book that, you know, I mean, it was terrible for the Northern Rivers, but it really gave me a good end to the book. You know, (laughs) swings and roundabouts. I mean, it was a perfect ending in some ways to the story that I'd been telling because it wrapped everything up because my story had been about both the positives and negatives of a community and I'd been able to – I'd been telling this story that in some ways was, you know, making fun of not the community itself but some of the ideas that were in the community so then to be able to have a story at the end that was able to showcase the power of the community and how powerful that community was when they worked together to help each other was i mean thematically really rewarding to what the end of the sh- the the book was and and again this is an editing thing like Malcolm was such a good editor because i had the end of my stand-up show is a story about um, the the gig that I, I did a gig that was a year. So I went a year in between gigs and I did a gig in Brisbane at the Brisbane Powerhouse for an anniversary. They had seven minutes. So I drove two and a half, three hours there for seven minutes on stage and then had to drive back that night and nearly died on the way home in a storm. And that's the end of my stand-up show, well, Logical, finishes mm-hmm. with that story and it has a whole bunch of callbacks and – that's the that's the final bit of the show. And uh, Malcolm was the person who said, yeah, but that shouldn't be – that's what I thought the end of the book was going to be as well. And he was like, no, that, that's not the end of the book. That's – the end of the book is like, the you know, you trying to get back to the festival and the story of – because the my show wasn't so much about me trying to get back to the festival. Like the, yeah, the stand-up show isn't about that. I am there. Yeah. But um, the book is a little bit more about that. And so, again, that was him who, you know, really reshaped it in that way, which was – it was good. I like I liked working with another editor as well because I'm not, I'm not precious about notes, you know, like particularly if I think they're good notes. And I thought he gave me really, really great notes about, you know, structure and, and how things should have been shaped. And so, yeah, I think, I think it ends absolutely how it should have ended, um, which is cool. You know, notes are interesting because sometimes even when someone's suggesting something, that suggestion might not technically be correct, but it helps define what is correct. And, uh, you know, if you've got someone that you're on the same wavelength yeah. with. Uh, well, that was why really Malcolm important. was even right about that. You know, you've got to lose 2%. I don't know which 2%. Yeah. I didn't lose the 2% that he – like, I mean, the story I lost was a story he liked, but I, right. I lost the right 2%. Yeah. Like – I know that now. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm absolutely confident that I lost the right thing, even though it wasn't the thing that he was suggesting. Yeah. So, you know, the book's called I Am Not Fine, Thanks, and uh, we are recording this at the end of 2022, officially the year known as What a Bummer. And mm. uh, what do you think is the best trait that you've had come out of all of this? <sighs> Um, I I would say that a lot of my conversations on 
my philosophy podcast, um, but also conversations I was having with my friends in 2019 in particular, 2018, 2019, were about how I thought I was doing the best work that I'd ever done, but I just, there was something about the feeling that I had on stage that I just wasn't getting the feeling from it that I once got from it. And it all going away and that idea that now every time you go back on stage, you know, there really is that sense of I could, this could be the last show, this could be the last time that I get to say something to people because we've lived that reality now. Mm -hmm. We've lived that period of time where, you know, it might be months or years in between when you get to do it again and... Unfortunately, Justin, you and I are now at an age where if we died, like, don't get me wrong, people would be sad and people might even say, oh, that's a pity, like he was, he's too young. But they wouldn't launch a coronial inquest, right? (laughs) 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 I'd be like, oh, well, that happens. Like, you know, we're now at an age where if we drop dead, people go, like, it would be sad and we hope that we would have many years in front of us but it 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 would just be one of those things that people go oh well you know they had a life and and so having that time to really think about that and think about what it is that i want to say and the way that i want to say it you know this book is you know it has its strengths and its weak and its weaknesses um but it is what i wanted to say you know, it is like it is filled with things that I wanted to say in the way that I wanted to say them. And my stand up show, like, was the best thing that I've, well, my favorite thing. People can choose what's the, what best means, but my favorite thing that I've ever done on stage, because I think it's the first time ever that I've been entirely honest on stage, you know, like both in what sort of comedy I like and how I like to say things and, you know, my perspective on things was just really legitimate to what my perspective on the world is. And all of that came out of all that time that I had to sit around and think about things during the pandemic. So that's the positive. The positive is that, you know, in a work sense, it's it's just really re-engaged me in it. And then the other thing is I'd always said for years that I had a passion for younger comedians and i think that i had walked that walk i think that i mm. tried to be supportive of of younger people but you and i both work on a television program on the abc called question everything which is a show that i came up with during the pandemic and the reason i came up with that show was to provide an opportunity particularly for younger comedians to not only get on tv but to work behind the scenes and learn how to do something like that behind the scenes and you know, in the last few months, we've really walked that talk mm. and and I have had opportunities to see young comedians sit on that panel and get experience, even just in the afternoons, not on, on TV, or had conversations with, you know, emerging comedians about what they did well and what they could do better. And, and my genuine uh, passion for that, like, you know, I've been pleased that, you know, it's easy to say that you have a passion for things like that, but mm. what if you did it and then you found it really annoying or really boring <laughs> <laughs> or really yeah. draining, right? Yeah. But I haven't. I've found it the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. Like I've just loved the whole experience of getting to see these people, you know, at the start or in the middle, you know, emerging into their careers and getting to see what they want to do. So – what about you? Let me ask you. I know we have to finish this up. We've probably done enough <laughs> for for this podcast, but um, thank you for hosting it for me. But what about you? What do you, what do you think that you learnt during that time, or about yourself during that time? Uh, you know, so uh, what was interesting for me was I uh, I kind of went through a bit of a depressed phase for a number of years and went into a little bit of you know without announcing it uh, self isolation. And then I was just coming out of it (laughs) (laughs) when uh, when isolation kicked in. Uh, And uh, to be honest, uh, I I think there was – I know that it was very challenging for a lot of people and there there was a 10-week period where I did not see anyone, like nobody. 
And I look back on that time quite fondly because it uh, allowed me to kind of recalibrate a little bit and uh, let go of a lot of stuff that, you know, not even really important things, but just little things that niggle at you, uh, kind of uh, reminded me of why I got into this in the first place. And uh, I, I feel like probably for the first time in a long time, I quite like me. I'm not. That doesn't mean I'm perfect, and it doesn't mean uh, there's not things that I can improve. But it's like, oh yeah, no, this is this is all right. You you've done okay. You know, you're a, you're a, a, a decent person who, even when you make mistakes, you try your best to get back on top of those things. And you'll be able to read about that in Justin's book. I am fine, thanks. I am fine. <laughs> Tickety boo. I'm great, uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Don't know what this dickhead's on about. I'm yeah. fantastic, mate. You need to do another lot of uh, isolation. It feels good. But the uh, and one of those things was you know because I worked you know, like I worked with young people in uh, you know when I lived in Adelaide and uh, and stuff like that. Tried to kind of give them opportunities that I missed out on when I was coming through the scene uh, and. And what I love is that the, the, the main thing that I like is that I'm not scared of youth. Like, I like new mm-hmm. ideas. I like being around young Same. people. I like them saying things to me that make me think, I've never thought of it that way. It doesn't mean you always agree, but you find ways in and you kind of understand things that are going on. And therefore, because I find that quite enjoyable and I find it quite inspiring – A lot of the things that people get angry about, I'm like, I don't know why you're getting angry about that. And I don't mean that from a self-righteous point of view. It's just, I just don't get angry at that stuff. I just kind of watch it. I accept it. And that's a very peaceful place to be. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not that person. And we've said this to each other a lot, but if I ever do become that person, please, you have my permission to hold a pillow over my head until... I am dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I get it. But I do. I think uh, I, I think uh, cynicism and mm. being jaded are the enemies of creativity. And I, I think it's all right for young people to be cynical. I think they should be because that means they're mm. questioning the foundations that our world is built around. But once you get to this point, there's no point in being cynical. Now you've got to build. Now you've got to help create. You've got to listen and you've got to try and open uh, passageways for people to uh, make proper change outwards and inwards. Uh, Thank you for doing this, Justin. I super appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. Um, uh, Buy my book. I am not fine, thanks. That's the whole point of this. Please. (laughs) (laughs) Buy my book. (laughs) Please, Uh, make him fine. Thanks to all of our guests on today's show. Remember, all books mentioned in today's show can be found right now at booktopia.com.au. Links can be found in the description. We would also love to hear what you're reading, so feel free to join the conversation on social media. Search Booktopia on your favourite platform and join our book club. We'll catch you for our next episode, but until then, thanks for listening and never stop reading. Stop reading.